Okay. Um, well, I'm Lisa Lippincott, and I'm here to tell you how to call C libraries from C++. And you probably, you know, the first thing you're going to think when somebody asks you, how do you call C libraries from C++, is C and C++ are very compatible. You can just include the header files and call them. There's a problem with that. This is what your code looks like when you do that. This, I did have to take a little bit of white, uh, some white space out of this to fit it on the slide. Um, this is the beginning of a program that goes on for another three slides, I think, um, that listens on a socket, connects to somebody, sends them a greeting, and echoes what they type. It's a fairly simple program, maybe something I wouldn't ordinarily write in one function, but it doesn't do all that much. But clearly, it is far too complicated. Um, in fact, you can tell what's complicating it by looking at the amount of this code that is actually devoted to achieving the goal I just gave you for the function. This is the code that is doing something useful. All of that gray code is just coping with the fact that you're calling a C library, in this case, POSIX sockets. <sighs> POSIX is, you know, it's a nice library, but honestly, it's not likely to ever have a good C++ interface because the existing C++, uh, the existing C interface can be called from C++ and at some level, people think that's good enough. Um, but you end up writing code like this. Another way of thinking about functions where clearly too much is going on is, is it trying to do more than one thing? And it's true, that goal I gave you at the beginning is really more than one thing. But this code is trying to do an extra thing. It's trying to cope with C. When you write a function, you should write it to do only one job. And my contention is that coping with C is a job. <laughs> so the question is, what are your alternatives? Uh, one alternative is go out and find some nice cross-platform library that does the same job and use it. If that alternative works for you, fine, do it. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the people who wrote that library. Um, but if what you need to do is actually interface with one of the, with a library like POSIX, then you need a layer in between. And there, over the years, there have been a lot of class frameworks that carry out a lot of your interfacing with operating systems and these sorts of things, which are, you know. Um, and they, um, they wrap it all in a nice, inherited, object-oriented fashion. And you can use them, and they're very nice. And then they die. Or and then you have to walk around them. Um, and some time back, I was lamenting this fact that these things keep dying. And I thought, why do they die? I'm here looking at a pit full of bones with a little rabbit in the middle of it. And I'm saying, look at the bones. <laughs> What's up with all the bones? <laughs> and the answer is, the economics are wrong. The design of those libraries is too expensive for the number of people who are going to be using them. The documentation is too expensive for the number of people who are going to be using them. And the people who are going to be using it will not only have to learn that library, they're going to have to end up learning the library underneath. So learning it is too expensive. And worst of all, perhaps, adapting existing code is too expensive. 
Um, sooner or later, because all of those other expenses are making that library get further and further away from the base case, from calling the system directly, uh, adapting expen uh, existing code is going to be, you're going to run into some existing code you need and adapting it to, to your code that's using this class library is going to be a nightmare. So, my answer is don't do that, it's too expensive. And I thought, how can we do this cheaply? How can we make all four of these things much, much less expensive so that we can have a thin interface layer that gets us out of writing C code and gets us into writing C++ as quickly as possible? And here is the answer I came up with. Don't redesign the library. Write design rules, just a few of them, and apply them to the library. We're going to take the existing library and build on top of it using a set of rules. This is less expensive because we're not redesigning apart from our design rules, and the design rules are short. I'm in fact going to show you a set of design rules that might have to be modified a little bit for particular libraries, but are pretty good. Um, documenting it, document the rules. People are going to learn the underlying library anyway. They're going to know its concepts. They should be able to look at something in the underlying library and just follow the rules and know what to call. Um, learning it becomes easy then because you learn the underlying library and you learn the rules. And adapting existing code, it doesn't quite follow from this that it's going to be easy, but the concepts are going to match and when, when writing the rules, I have gone a long way to try and make the rules produce very compatible code. <sighs> Any questions so far? Um, so let's get into the rules. Rule number one, the general design principle. Match the original library. Type for type, function for functions, except for some exceptions. Everything else is going to be pretty much how do you find the exceptions and what to do with them. But this means POSIX has a type that represents the socket. We're going to make a type that represents the socket. POSIX has a call to make a socket. We're going to make a call to make a socket. POSIX has a call to listen on a socket. We're going to have a call to listen on the socket. Type for type, function for function. So we're going to have to name all those things. We need rules for what the names of things are going to be. And the e so one approach to making a new set of names is stick a prefix in front of everything. Marshall does not like the idea of sticking a prefix in front of everything because we've built into C++ a nice way to stick a name in front of everything. We call it a namespace. So we're just going to put our entire compatibility layer in a namespace. Here we go. You choose a namespace name. My compatibility layer for between POSIX and C++, I'm going to call P07. Um, and when a name exists in the library, I'm going to use the same name in my namespace. I see one person got the etymology of PO7. Uh, um, can't use that for macros. Macros are bad, but we're going to lowercase them. Um, so you lowercase the macro names because you have to pick a different identifier in that case. Marshall, I think, once again, knows you're going to run into some things that aren't uppercase, mac some macros that aren't uppercase, and you're kind of hosed. Uh, you'll have to make something up when you get to that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
We are going to have to invent some new types and function, type names and function names, um, some particular things. We're going to use unique, uh, names starting with unique for ownership types. Uh, what do I mean, mean by ownership types? I mean that thing that is called RAAI, responsibilities. What I read, you know, ownership is also a bad word for that. Because what you owe, what you own when you own an RAI object is a debt. This is, ownership means debt. So this is how you recognize ownership. You own something when when you get it, it comes with a debt. <laughs> a unique pointer, and honestly, I'm going to show you why unique pointer is really the only ownership type you need for anything that's not shared. <laughs> um, when you get a unique pointer, the, it is, I, I know how to get to that thing, it's a pointer, and it's got a debt attached to it, I owe one call to whatever the deleter function is. So. Ah, so, um, that's ownership. For unsafe conversions, we're going to name things underscore cast so they look unsafe. Um, otherwise, we're going to try to fit in with the library names as best we can. We'll have to make some things up. But try not to make up too many. But make up enough. Make up the right number. <laughs> <sighs> So types, we need design rules for what to do about types. Here we are, we're going to use the existing types for, existing types for unitless numbers. Unitful numbers are not the same type as unitless numbers. Um, so we're going to have to do something about them. We're also going to have to do something about the times when Numeric types are used to mean something that isn't a number at all. And that's the most common case in our POSIX, POSIX example. I counted seven different types. In this one POSIX example, there are seven different types that POSIX says are integer. And there are seven different types. Uh, so we're going to be refining integer into a number of different types to match each of the meanings that POSIX has for it. Um, that's going to be done with some sort of wrapper type. Um, and we're going to, add, when we do that, we get a chance to add sensible operators. We'll do that. Um, for structure types, there are some times where it would be nice to do the same thing for structure types. But C++ doesn't provide a good way to make a structure type that is like that structure type. You can do contains, but it doesn't work very well. You end up making copies. Um, I'm going to say, unless you have to, try to use the existing structure types from the, from the library you're wrapping. Uh, where necessary, refine them into templates. You might think that no type in, um, in POSIX could possibly really be a template. You'd be wrong, we'll have an example later. <laughs> um, and of course, create those ownership types, unique underscore something for resources. Ah, with all of those um, extra types, there's going to be conversion operators involved. So, here are our design rules for conversions. All of our wrapping conversions are named wrap. There is only one function for it. It's a template, but it's, there's one name for wrapping. There is one name for unwrapping, one name for seizing, one name for releasing. Those are what you have to do to get around those um, to do the conversions between our wrapped types and the time you have to go around our library one day. Um, 
for safe building of structures and other conversions make. And for unsafe, things that are under store cast, there are many of those. Well, not that many, but there's more than one of those because while there is one way to be safe, there are infinitely many ways to not be safe. <laughs> so now we've got types. We need rules for our functions. The rules for our functions are about twice as long. <laughs> we'll start with the parameter list. You pass the same parameters as the library function, with exceptions. Um, output parameters. We don't pass in output parameters. We return outputs. We're going to pass by value or reference, even if POSIX passes by pointer. Um, we're going to pass our nice types every time. We're going to use ownership types to transfer ownership. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with using ownership types, but you only pass the ownership types around when you're transferring the ownership. For regular pointers or regular whatever, we just pass the regular whatever. If the value of a parameter changes the type of the function, this is the hard rule, by the way. If the value of a parameter changes the type of a function, what do I mean by that? I mean those things that are really hard to pronounce for the most part. Functal, yachtal, in this case, init and top. Um, get sock opt is one of them. That's not too bad. Um, but these take an integer parameter that tells you what the types of the other parameters are. This is C trying to do templates. If C is trying to do templates, put a template on it. Your life will be nicer. <laughs> and finally, just a general rule of we can put in some default arguments and overloads where they're sensible. Nobody is going to get upset by a sensible default argument or overload. And if people don't know it's there, they'll get along without it. So that's the going in part of a function. How about the going out part? We're going to return the same results, except uh, we're going to throw our errors instead of returning them. You want to get as fast as possible into the nice world where everything is, is ownership types and exceptions. Um, we're going to return outputs for output parameters. So they did go somewhere. They didn't just get lost. We're going to skip outputs that are made redundant by type safety. That's a weird little rule. Um, and you might not see where that is. But um, for example, um, get sock adder. Um, it's one of those things that's really a template underneath. And something it returns to you is the size of the structure you should have passed in if you had passed in the right structure for the socket address. So since we're being type safe, there's not much point in returning the size of the structure you were supposed to pass in. So skip those. Um, we're going to use our nice types for returning. And if it all adds up to returning more than one thing, we'll return a tuple. And we'll just do it in the original order. I put the return type at the front, because I'm kind of old school and I write my return types at the front, sometimes. So what does code look like when you're using a library that does all this? And nothing else. It's just doing this. Here's our code. This time, the entire code of the function fit on the slide. Um, I've put some of the namespace, put some of the namespace qualifiers in gray. Those are the ones that are optional because associated namespace lookup will find those functions for you just fine. Um, but here we are. We make a socket, we listen, we accept, we print out the address. Oh, yeah, we start listening. Um, 
we print out, I forgot, we printed out the socket name. We printed out the, connect, uh, the name that we got connected from. We close the listening socket. We do our greeting and echo. We close our connection. Whole thing right there. Um, you might be thinking, well, you used those unique types for ownership. Um, why are you doing explicit closes? Explicit closes are important because an explicit close gives you a chance to throw the exception that happens when you flush. So on a success path, you want to always have an explicit close. Um, and we use a move, so there is no danger of closing it again. Um, on a failure path, we can go ahead and eat the exception because the exception then is just meaning you're failing even more. We've already failed, it'll be fine. Um, so let's do the same test that we did with the first one. How much of this code is achieving the stated purpose of the function? There. Uh, we lost a little in that middle section where we tried to put names on the things coming back from except, except returned us a tuple. Um, I could have made that a little briefer if I wanted to mention the names of those types. Um, I thought this was, I thought doing it without mentioning the names of those types had a nice property. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, we also lost a little bit down here with the street, uh, with the cast to stream size. That's a signedness conversion. Um, in real life, I might have used a cast that made explicit. I was just losing this. I was just going signed because receive gives me a signed length and for no particularly good reason, although other people will disagree, coot right takes an unsigned length. Um, so that's the tour of that. There is one interest. Mike is still on. Um, there is one in, can you still hear me? Uh, there is one interesting thing that I got out of this that wasn't anywhere near true in the original code, which is this digit six here. Uh, that digit six means that we are connecting on IPv6. Um, if, you ch if you remove that digit six, then this code works perfectly well on IPv4. That's the only place we have to actually talk about the domain of the socket. Which I think is a neat property. <sighs> so, that's what the code looks like when we use the library. How do we make that interface layer? Uh, well, first we get the rule. We've seen the rules. Those were a little hard to come up with, um, but they're done. Um, how do we make those, those calls, the PO7 socket, the um, PO7 accept, so forth, how do we make those types, like whatever PO7 socket is returning? Um, and so forth. Um, and you might be asking yourself this question. Applying rules to a library seems rather mechanical. Can't a computer do, it, do that? And that was really the challenge that got me to go through this in the past couple of months. It's like, I bet a computer can do a lot of that work. And my answer to this is, mostly a computer can do that. Um, it needs a bit more information. It needs to know the type mappings. It needs to know that whatever is representing a socket is in POSIX is in fact an int. Um, it needs to know how those type mappings apply to the improved functions. You have to write the parameter lists and return types of each of those, each of the wrapper functions. Uh, you're going to have to pick up some things from the documentation of the underlying library. 
which parameters are in, which ones are out, which ones are in out, how you, how you check for errors and how you get those out of the results, um, how to test for failures, what exceptions to throw. So we are going to have to provide some stuff, but if we can provide that sort of stuff in a reasonably convenient notation, uh, then it becomes fairly easy to write these wrappers for types and functions. Um, so let's begin. Uh, the first type, the, a really fundamental type in POSIX socket, is int, which means the domain of a socket. It is what kind of network you're using, or rather what the addressing family of the network is. It's Internet 6 or Internet 4 or a few other things. And here's the type for it. It's an enum class, which means it's another thing that is like int, you know, because we said int, um, but it's not int. It is a strong type. It can be converted to and from int with a static cast. Um, and, but it's not int. It won't get confused with int. It won't get confused with other things that you don't want to confuse with int that are different. Um, we are going to provide a number of constants. These guys are macros, so they are lower cased on this side. That thing in the middle is how we say in PO7, socket domain t, t needs to be unwrapped when we call POSIX functions. Um, and the manner of unwrapping is the enum wrapper. Plus plus is a small library I wrote on the way. It is the library for making these layers. It is the automation in the machine that does that. Um, so this is plus plus enum wrapper, which is a thing that says, yeah, when you wrap, use a static cast. When you unwrap, also use a static cast. Um, so there we are. That is the entire declaration of name T plus all of these constants. Yes? I could have done that. Um, if you, you know, if you have a closed enumeration, and the problem is enumerations are never truly closed, um, you can get away with that. You do have to still say colon int because POSIX, oh, I will repeat the question. Why aren't these constants part of the enum? Um, if, there were, if it was a closed enumeration, you can get away with putting the constants in the enumeration declaration. But once you've written a declaration, you want to try and arrange things so that you never have to modify it. Someday, somebody is going to I invent Internet 8. I think we're on course for 8. Uh, 7 will probably not work the way 5 didn't. Um, and there will be a new constant you can just add to this list. It's a separate declaration. It might, you might even add to it in a different file. Um, certainly, POSIX sockets is designed to work with more than four kinds. So I decided to go with the style that people are going to be using for extending this. When Internet 8 comes along, the file that declares the Internet 8 stuff can just have another one of these in it. Okay, that was a rather boring type. Let's get a little bit more interesting. We can look at socket. Here are the integers that represent sockets. We have a fairly weak generic type, socket t. We're using a different mechanism from plus plus to make this type. I'll get to that in a second. Um, we have a more specific socket type Socket, uh, socket in domain, which represents a socket within a particular addressing domain. Uh, the reason these, are, uh, these need to be distinguished 
is that the domain of a socket changes some of the functions that apply to it. They change type. When you get the address, you, have, you get the address differently. You get the address in a different return type um, from an Internet 6 socket than from an Internet 4 socket. So socket had to be refined to specify the type, uh, the domain of the socket for some calls. Um, OK, plus plus boxed is the thing that we're using this. It takes a small set of traits. It makes a nice integer-like type that is not an integer, or actually anything like type that is not that original type, by putting a box around it. It's a class. It has one member that is the thing in the box. And these declarations say what to do with the thing in the box. First declaration up there says the default value of the, of the thing in the box is going to be minus 1, and this box is going to have equality and comparison operations on it. Um, there's no declaration here that says um, here is what we do when we are unwrapping a box type, because elsewhere I made a general declaration of any place plus plus passes a box type to POSIX, it needs to be unwrapped in the boxed manner. So those just happen automatically after that declaration. Um, down here, very nearly the same thing. This last declaration, the operator socket tag, um, is a conversion. Socket and domain tags convert to socket tags. And that we follow the same convention that you've probably seen a lot elsewhere. It goes at least back to um, Alex Andrescu's books, um, that if the tag converts, the types will convert. Or at least if the tag, if the tag converts and the contents will convert, the types will convert. So socket and domain converts to socket T, which is exactly the conversion you want. There is a cast operation I'm not showing you. I wrote a function that is the cast upward from socket T to socket and domain T. So that's how you do wrapping for ordinary types. Enums, boxed, I don't know what else you might need. You can roll your own if you need it. But uh, enums and boxed, I think, cover most of your wrapping needs. So. What about ownership types? Sorry to the people listening to the tape. I keep bumping the microphone. Um, ownership types. Uh, there's really only one unique ownership type. I mentioned it already. Unique pointer. You don't need anything else. You might think that, well, Socket is just an int. You don't want to create a heap block and do new and delete to, on just an int just to manage a socket, because really it was a perfectly good value type all along. But it turns out unique pointer doesn't require that rigmarole. All you have to do is tell it, I'm not using a real pointer to, for this. I'm using something else. Excuse me. Here we go. Um, you are going to have to give it a deleter. Here's the deleter for the two socket types. Um, and of course, the second one is a template, because many domains. Um, the deleter just says, instead of a pointer, we're going to use this type plus plus provides called pointer to value. Um, it's like a pointer, but pointers point to objects. Objects have identity. They have that address about them that matters. Pointer to value points to a value, in this case, a number, or, well, a socket T, but yeah, underneath it's a number. So if the number of your socket is 3, the number that the pointer to value will point to is 3. Um, and they have all the necessary semantics that are kind of pointer-like that unique pointer needs. So you just say, that's what kind of pointer I'm using. 
here is my deleter, which um, the function is actually going to call close. Not throw an exception, because you can't throw an exception out of a deleter. Um, and then we will just say a unique socket is a unique pointer with the socket deleter. Uh, useful thing to know, this trick only works if the socket t that you point to is const. You can't have people actually modifying the socket t through your unique pointer. So it points to const socket t. And so when people say star of the unique pointer, the thing they get is not modifiable. Um, it's very slick. If you're not using this to manage your resources, you should be using this to manage your resources. Maybe not with my class. Maybe one day there will be a class like this in the standard, because it is so useful. Um, maybe there is in 14. I don't think I've seen it, though. Resource. What? Unique resource. Unique resource is there? OK. This is all written to C++11, because that's what my compiler does. Um, and that seemed like enough for now. Maybe I'll give them the talk again in three years. Um, so there we are. Deleter for socket t, deleter for socket in domain. Deleter for socket in domain has the, that same conversion operator we saw before, um, because unique pointer follows that same convention. Um, if the deleter converts, then you can converge the unique pointers. And we want to be able to convert in that direction. Once again, not shown, there is an underscore cast function that will take a unique socket and turn it into a unique, so uh, into a unique socket in domain um, by, forcing, uh, by forcing things to say that domain. Dangerous, but we named it underscore cast. So that's pretty much wrapping types. We can wrap ordinary types. We can wrap uh, ownership types. Um, what do we do about functions? And this is kind of where it all comes together. So here is the socket call. Socket, if you haven't been following, socket is the name of the function that makes a socket. Uh, it's going to return a unique socket in, in its base case. It's going to return a unique socket. And we're going to call this thing invoke. Invoke is actually a PO7 function used internally. It adds a couple of parameters onto the parameter list that describe the PO7 customization points. Um, but really, it's just a call through to plus plus invoke with a couple more parameters. Um, and the things that go into invoke are a group. I call them groups. We'll get to that in a second. A group for the result. We, are ex we want to get back a unique socket. We're adding on a little, thing, a little modifier to that. We're going to fail if that thing tests false. Uh, the unique socket testing false is the pointer inside the unique pointer um, thinks it's null. The pointer inside the unique pointer thinks it's null if it's pointing to the default constructed socket t. The default constructed socket t is minus 1. This fails if socket returns minus 1. A little bit of a chain there to follow. But it's the right thing to test. So it fails when, it, when the unique pointer can, um, tests false. Um, thing we're calling, colon, colon, socket. That's the POSIX function, because we put the colons on it. Um, we're going to pass a group of input parameters. The domain, the type, the protocol are all input parameters. And we're going to pass, it, we're going to tell it one more thing. If we throw, we are going to throw something that we got from Erno. Um, that's throw from Erno is a little four-line class that I had to set up for doing PO7. It 
is how a lot of PO uh, a lot of POSIX things. Um, it is how a lot of POSIX things return their errors and how to convert them to exceptions. So um, then down below, I'll, I'll do the lower part of the code quickly and then get back to invoke because invoke is fun. Um, invoke is kind of, that's where the challenge is. Um, here we have um, socket call where you specify the domain as a template parameter. If you specify the domain as a template parameter, then what you're going to get back is a socket in that domain. You only pass the socket type in the protocol. And we're just going to call the other socket and cast it up to that domain. So that's the code. Invoke is, like I said, that's the interesting function. What invoke does is it unwraps any of the parameters that are marked as wrapped for your library. Um, it releases any resources that need to be released. There's a general declaration for PO7 that says all the unique pointers are going to need to be released because POSIX doesn't use unique pointers. Pretty much, I don't know why you would use anything else, because if your underlying library is using unique pointers and you have to use plus plus, I don't know what's going on. Um, we're going. Um, after that, it goes through um, all of the parameters and takes pointers to the things that need to be passed as pointers. I uh, didn't show you the, there's another one of those general declarations, pass the structures by pointer because POSIX passes all of its structures by pointers. It can be overridden if necessary. Um, then you have a parameter list for the POSIX function. Call the POSIX function. Um, then you go through doing those same sorts of things in reverse. Uh, wrap up any results and any, uh, any in-out parameters. Um, seize the resources. I got that in the wrong order. And it's in the library. It's in the right order for exception safety. Uh, and um, then we're going to rearrange things. We're going to take the things that are that were out parameters and we're actually going to turn them into results. And we're going to take the things that were error codes and check them for failure. And then we're going, if we failed, we're going to pick up the exception from throw error from Erno. And if we didn't fail, we'll pick up all the results and return them maybe in a tuple. It does all that. So all of that happens. And in fact, the result is always going to be a unique socket because nobody said there was anything else to return. And that gets us to the end. We pass it back. <sighs> That's really how far it goes. Are there questions? Do you want to see more code? Um, Yes, use the mic, get it on the tape if you can. Um, so if you're wrapping a library that's uh, like its naming convention has a prefix in front of all of the functions, uh, would your suggestion be to remove that prefix? And then also, um, a lot of those libraries pass like the context struck as the first parameter. Would you say to put those as member functions on the types that you're creating? Um, First one, I think that's a judgment call that I would be tempted to make, but it's going to depend on the library you're using. Um, the second one, member functions are just going to mess you up. Um, you'll notice that in the code example, it was just functions and classes. Um, and you know, it's going to, you know, it is tempting to say that I want to say socket.accept. It's nice syntax. It doesn't really buy you much. Um, except of socket is pretty good syntax. And you don't have to make classes. And making 
I mean it's a class, but you don't have, member functions are just a path that is going to end up with, you've got types that are not fully compatible with the original types. Thank um, you. Anything else? Marshall. Um, well, I would, I would just say that, uh, that if you were wrapping such a library, what, what I would be tempted to do is do it the way Lisa had suggested. And then if you wanted to create additional types with member functions, you could do that on top of that. You know, have a layering set up where the where first thing you do is you get ownership and error handling. And then, you know, if you want to build an object-oriented thing on top of that, then that would be easy. Yes. So I'll repeat Marshall's point, um, and I agree with it, that this is not necessarily the only layer you want to write. Um, if you want to go higher, do this first. Get the interfacing to C out of the way, and you can write whatever you want on top of it. You can have beautiful classes written on top of this, and you won't be bothered by the C when you're writing your beautiful classes. Or you can go cross-platform, calling down to this, or calling down to the beautiful classes that are in still another intermediate layer. Layers are good. Have lots. Um, any other questions? Uh, oh, here's one. Um, have you done any thinking about the uh, <clears throat> the reverse of this? And in that sense, I'm talking about uh, on Windows P invocable interfaces, where I have a C++ library coming from a C interface. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, I have. Oh, the question is, have I, done, have I thought about the reverse of this? That is, take a nice, uh, take a place where, say, POSIX, an underlying library, wants to call my function, and it, it has a calling convention, and I want to take my function and put a wrapper around it that matches the bad calling convention. And yes, I have. Um, I haven't thought sufficiently about it this time around. Um, this library, or this is actually kind of a reanimation of an old project that Marshall is familiar with, and so that's why he knew where things were going. Um, that, and I think he liked it. <laughs> he says he did. Um, and um, so in that, I did that. And back in C++ 98, no variadic templates and some other problems, no R value references. It was hard, but yeah, it worked. Um, I think it could work a lot easier. And if there had been another month between when I thought about having this talk and when I and today when I am giving this talk, that I might have actually showed you that, but. There was not time. Um, any other questions? Have you tried running anything aside from DSD sockets, just or POSIX stuff, uh, just to see how the library holds up against other interfaces? Uh, the question is, have I tried wrapping anything else? Um, and not anything else serious. Um, what I have done is I, I wrote a horrible thing to wrap. And I wrapped my horrible thing to wrap um, just so that I could bounce things into all the edge cases and go through and make sure there weren't unnecessary copies of things happening. And um, so there was a round of that. And there was do the. Um, and do the POSIX thing. Um, going further back, not in the past couple of months, um, when I did this the first time around, it wasn't actually for POSIX. It, these rules, more or less, I've improved them since then. Um, but these rules are from a library nitrogen that I did long ago. 
And that was a wrapper around Apple's carbon interface, now deprecated, so nobody has much call to use nitrogen anymore. Um, and in part, plus plus is designed to speed up the things that I found were slow when doing nitrogen wrapper functions. Um, because a lot of that was done by hand in nitrogen. More questions? People want to see more code? Or? <laughs> okay. Ah, Marshall points out people might want to know where they can get the code. The code is in the public domain. It, I'm putting it in the conference materials. So you will all have a copy of the code. I wouldn't be at all surprised if the conference website might have a copy of the code. Not yet, because you know that sort of thing hasn't been done yet. But um, I'm hoping that by the, well, Marshall won't know. Somebody will know how fast the conference materials will get on to some place where you can get at them. Um, so I'll show you some code. Um, Let's switch to, let's find my cursor. There it is. And let's switch to mirroring so that you can see what I see. It must be here somewhere. having a little trouble finding the control, but is that on arrangement? Ah, it is on arrangement. Doink. Here we are, we're mirrored. Code. Um <laughs> There's that class, it's scrolled a little. Um, throw error from Erno that I told you about. It, I guess we'll start there. Um, this is one of those parameter groups I told you about. Um, it is the same sort of thing that in was, that said these parameters are going in. Um, throw error from Erno is a custom one of those. It will pass no parameters because the passed parts returns an empty tuple. Um, it will also return nothing because the return parts is an empty tuple. Um, check for failure, it's off the edge of the, s whoops. Check for failure is off the edge of the screen, but it will say, ah, this part didn't make you fail um, because Erno doesn't make you fail unless you're in the case where it does, that's down here, <laughs> different, uh, different class. Um, and finally, the interesting function in there is just, we're going to make a tuple that contains the system error from Erno. All of the groups return tuples of things. Usually you only want to have one exception that you're throwing, but if you do manage to have more than one or less than one, it will still throw an exception. It's just guaranteed to be derived from everything that the parameter groups and result groups um, provide. Um, that's pretty much, you know, custom error handling group. There's make system error from Erno, but it's not very complicated. It's just system error and whatever. But, um, and, ah, here we go. I told you invoke was a, was just call plus plus invoke and add some more parameters. So, it's just forwarding everything to plus plus invoke with this wrapper Caesar and forwarder. Um, and so this looks pretty boring too. It's just go to plus plus invoke, but use the PO7 wrappers, use the PO7 Caesars, use the PO7 forwarder. The PO7 forwarder is up there at the top of the screen. PO7 just uses for plus plus forward outputs and non scalars as pointers which matches the POSIX convention. If you need to do, 
if you need to take pointers in some other convention, you might have to write something there. Or maybe you're lucky and your underlying library actually just uses references, and then you, you know, use a different class there. Um, let's see. Do people have suggestions on what code they want to see? Or no? Um, there is. Here's the other setting up PO7 um, file, which is, here is setting up wrapper. I told you there was a declaration. Um, PO7 wrapper is the customization point for PO7 doing wrapping. It says which types need to be unwrapped when I pass them to POSIX. And the default is, all box types are wrapped. So that's why I only had to set it up for, um, for the um, enums. I was a little afraid POSIX conceivably might use an enum someplace. I don't know of a place where it uses a real enum, but it might. Um, and so I decided enums we would do in a case-by-case -case basis. Um, here are the wrap functions. Again, just forward everything to plus plus, and it will do wrap with my wrapper. Um, it will do unwrap with my wrapper. Um, seize and release, exactly the same thing, except this time plus plus, all unique pointers are seized. Um, so POSIX never, knows a, never gets a unique pointer. Every unique pointer that we pass to it gets released. Um, here's the code for um, setting up make. Um, make needs the opposite trick from um, wrappers and caesars. Wrappers and caesars take a template parameter and uh, a, on a function and use it to go to a functor class so that you can get partial specialization even though you called a function. Functions, in my opinion, really ought to have partial specialization. Overloading does not completely substitute. But you can hand off and get partial specialization, which is what Wrapper and Caesar needs. Um, make is actually the opposite trick. Um, make, you pass a function template parameter, and you want to use overloading on it. The way to do that is you turn it into a regular function parameter. Make calls make anything. It passes a first parameter, which basically identifies the type we're trying to make. Um, and there's, you know, the type we're trying to make is called thing to make. So anytime you need to add another make function into PO7, POSIX or plus plus doesn't help out with this because that's really all there is to the trick. <laughs> I couldn't make that any shorter. Um, so anytime you're trying to make something with PO7, you call PO7 make. It calls make anything with the first parameter telling, saying, delivering the type information and nothing else. And that gets you to whatever overload of make anything is written. So make stud string of socket address is just an overload of make anything, which is make anything thing to make stud string, takes a socket address as its second parameter, const reference, um, does the thing. Um, we have a custom wrapper here for um, within PO7. Um, stud error code within PO7 matches int from POSIX. And that's what this is about. Um, it's got a function here to make the, it, to wrap um, an int into a, a stud error code. And it has the inverse of that, which takes the error code and produces the int. Implementations are off the right margin. Um, it's just what you expect. Ah, I think we're over.